Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, October 13th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope you're not uh, the superstitious type, Friday the 13th, uh, nothing to be afraid of. Uh, a lot of people are, though. It's kind of funny. Anyway, let's have a look at a few things going on today out of the Times of Israel. And yes, I, I'm still fighting like this whole, I don't know if it's like virus or uh, allergies or what exactly. Um, it's one of those annoying things that uh, I, I deal with, you know, as we go through life. We get sick, we get well, whatever. Um, not going to let it slow me down. Hopefully by Monday I will sound better and feel better, but who knows. Anyway, uh, out of the Times of Israel, experts warn if Trump scraps nuke deal, Iran could quickly build the bomb. They could quickly build the bomb. I've always thought this Iran nuke deal was kind of strange. Giving them $150 billion and then saying, but don't build any nukes. They have, Iran has two separate divisions of nuclear technology, one for civilian purposes, one for military purposes. The IAEA has examined most of the civilian designated nuclear facilities and said, oh, they're fine, they're following the rules, they're doing everything right, but they haven't inspected most of the military sites, especially Fordo, which is underground, deep in the mountains on purpose, so they can't be easily bombed. just find it strange that an inspection agency doesn't get to inspect all of their nuclear facilities and then comes out and tells the rest of us, oh yeah, everything's good, they're, they're fine, they're good, and no problems, no issues. Trump going to decertify the Iran nuclear deal. This could unravel this landmark agreement. He's already come out and said it, it's horribly drafted. It's a terrible deal. We give them $150 billion and they give us nothing. Kind of strange. I'm sure there's some people along the coast of Texas or Florida that would love to have some of that money. Puerto Rico. Love to have some of that $150 billion for food and water and medicine and clothing and shelter. But let's give it to a rogue terrorist nation. Thanks, Obama. Trump trying to undo that horrible deal. Probably a good thing. Out of the Times of Israel, after a UNESCO bombshell, the U.S. envoy Haley warns the U.N. of more trouble ahead. She said, uh, yeah... Looking at all the outrageous anti-Israel decisions, we're going to be looking at all agencies within the UN with similar scrutiny. If you're hating on Israel for no apparent reason, just because they're Israel, then yeah, we'll probably withdraw from you also. Hmm. Interesting. The UN, which represents the world. Nikki Haley, Donald Trump threatening to remove the United States from these agencies if they don't straighten up. They're going after Israel while they seem to do nothing about what's going on in Syria. They do nothing about Iran pursuing nuclear weapons while they've said we need to destroy Israel and we're going to destroy America. But heaven forbid those Jewish people build some homes for the Jews. I mean, let's, let's get real. Out of the Washington Examiner, Congress warned that North Korea EMP attack would kill 90% of all Americans. <clears throat> Congress warned that North Korea is capable of attacking the U.S. with a nuclear EMP electromagnetic pulse bomb that could indefinitely shut down the electric power grid and kill 90% of all Americans within a year. 90%. You know, as I recall, our forefathers that started this country, the immigrants who came from Europe to start this country, they didn't have electricity. They lived for quite some time. 
Why is this person saying that, oh, well, if there's an EMP attack and the electric grid is out, 90% of all Americans will be dead within a year? I'm not sure I follow the logic here. Um, hmm. Shut down the U.S. electric power grid for an indefinite period, leading to the death within a year of up to 90% of all Americans. You know, I like to think we're a little more resilient than that. I like to think that we are able to continue to survive one way or another. But who knows? You know, maybe there's a lot of people out there have a problem with finding their own food and living on the land and camping, if it were. Interesting. It's strange that they give these ideas. Oh, well, if there were an EMP attack, 90% of all Americans would die. North Korea's probably like, thank you. Hmm, maybe we should do an EMP attack. <laughs> I find it amazing what they share these days. Out of USA Today, a small quake registered in area of North Korea. Previous nuclear tests occurred. A small earthquake has been detected in an area of North Korea where previous nuclear tests have been carried out, said the U.S. Geological Survey. A 2.9 quake. And they don't know if it was natural or man-made. Very interesting. You know, we're watching so many things happen these days that just, to me, show us that we are in those times spoken of in Scripture prior to the return of Christ. Um, it, it's hard to not believe this, for me anyway. Uh, so Hamas and Fatah have reached a unity agreement. Out of the Times of Israel, Prime Minister says Israel to oppose Palestinian unity government unless... Hamas disarms and stops terror. Netanyahu warns Hamas Fatah reconciliation deal makes peace harder to achieve and says the terror group must end its war to destroy Israel. Hamas has a business plan, a business model. Basically, they say, yeah, we only exist to destroy Israel. That's the only reason they exist, to seek the complete and utter annihilation of Israel. It's amazing to me how uninformed people are. They'll say, oh, Israel is apartheid. Really? Because they have Jews and Christians and Arabs and Muslims in their government. Everyone's allowed to worship however they choose. Everyone has the same voice. However, the Palestinians have said, oh, in our new state, our Palestinian state, there will be no Jews. There will be no Jews in the government, no Jews in the country, no Jews allowed. We'll drive them out, we'll force them out, we'll kill them if we have to. Who's really apartheid? How about we point the finger where it really goes? At Times of Israel. Hamas says the unity deal is so we can all work together against Zionist enterprise. Okay, so you came together in unity so you can come against Israel. Huh. Thanks for letting us know your real motives. Also out of the Times of Israel, Jordan condemns provocative Jewish visits to the Temple Mount. 2,265 Jews visit the holy site during Sukkot holiday. Amman decries influx as storming of all Aqsa Mosque by settlers and Jewish extremists. Yeah, because they blew up several bombs and they, they killed several Muslims. They were throwing fire bombs and... Yeah, no. Storming the al Aqsa by settlers and Jewish extremists. You know... I don't know about you guys, but I'm so tired of the lies. I'm so tired of the half-truths. I'm so tired of those who don't know the real God. Claiming that their version is correct as they kill people to satisfy their God. 
You know, Jesus said in John 16 that they will kill you thinking they're serving God. But Jesus went on to say, but they don't know the Father nor me. Pretty clear. Those shouting Allahu Akbar while they kill you or blow themselves up in hopes of killing others also, they don't know God. They don't know Jesus. Jesus said so himself. Here's a sign of the time story out of Yahoo. Collective consciousness to replace God. Humanity no longer needs God, but may, with the help of artificial intelligence, develop a new form of collective consciousness that fulfills the role of religion, said U.S. author Dan Brown. Dan Brown. So you're going to create an artificial intelligence and then bow down and worship it as God. I'm sorry, you may think you're wise and smart, but you're just an ignorant fool. I was always amazed in the Old Testament when people would build a, a golden statue and then fall down and worship it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you just created this thing with your hands. It can't speak, it can't move, it can't do anything, and you're going to worship it like it's God? What an idiot! Same thing here, just a little different with a different spin. A 2017 kind of spin on idols. Hmm. Create artificial intelligence and then worship it as God. Bunch of morons. Proclaiming themselves to be wise, they became as fools. The Bible says. Hmm. <laughs> These are those times, people. These are the times the Bible speaks of. It's amazing to me how so many people can be so blind to this truth. How so many people are more concerned with who's winning a stupid baseball game tonight. Forgive me, all you baseball fans. I like baseball, but, you know, I like playing baseball. I don't so much like watching baseball. It's too boring to watch. It's fun to play, too boring to watch. Sorry. I don't care who wins. Maybe if the Rangers were there, yeah, I still would be like, mm. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Loved playing baseball growing up. Uh, I was all district center fielder, so... <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Um, in Matthew 10, 28... Matthew 10, 28, this is Jesus talking. He says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, you ever hear people say, Man, when I get to heaven, I got a few questions for God. Um, and I understand. I get that. But again, God's thoughts and ways are so far above us that we can't possibly understand. But I get it. You know, people are like, well, why does God allow this tragedy? Why does God allow young innocents to die and suffer? Why did does God let this happen? I get that. I have a feeling, though, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be very concerned with things here on earth. I mean, let's face it. Um, it, it's kind of like the old out of sight, out of mind. Oh, we're in heaven. We're in paradise. We have the Lord God Almighty. Oh, there's some distress on earth. <laughs> Let them deal with it. Right? I mean, I don't think we're going to care about a lot of the questions we have for God right now once we get there. I mean, we're going to see God for who he is and we're going to be just like him. Everything else will probably become a lot more clear at that point. Um, I mean, let's face it, our understanding of God is very limited. It's quite finite. I mean, God's wisdom is infinite. It's great. It's amazing. It's far beyond anything we can possibly comprehend. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12... 
it tells us, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. We see things imperfectly, like strange reflections in a mirror, but then we're going to see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I'm going to know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Heaven's going to be more amazing, greater than anything we've ever imagined. It's not going to be angels flying around on clouds, strumming harps. Sorry. Um, you can take the most incredible, amazing things here on planet Earth and multiply it times a bazillion. And you'll just get a small glimpse of what heaven will be like. But it'll be forever, for all eternity. So, with that in mind, and knowing that God has you in his hand, let's ponder what really scares us. What are you really afraid of? Think of the most frightening, unimaginable thing ever. What is it? You know, the worst scenario isn't really dying. I think the worst scenario that could possibly happen is dying without knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. But that's what's going to happen to billions of people. They're going to die without knowing Jesus. That's the worst case scenario I can think of. That's the sum of all fears because you're going to spend eternity in hell, separated from God. Hmm. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body if they can't touch your soul. But fear God, who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not afraid. You don't live in fear. To live is Christ. To die is gain. We are in God's hands. And no terrorist, no wacko with a machine gun, no nuclear weapon, no exploding asteroid, no terror by night, Nothing can take you out of God's hands. Trust God. Thank God. Worship God. Serve God. Live for God. Don't worry about all this petty stuff. In Psalm 19, verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. <laughs> I'm a pretty simple guy. It's God's word that gives me wisdom. It's the Holy Spirit that leads me and guides me. There's a book called The Journey. Billy Graham wrote it. He, he writes uh, about coming to a place in his life of reconciling himself to God's word as the complete word of God. Because early on in his ministry, he had a friend that challenged his way of thinking, the way he talked about the Bible. His friend said Billy's approach was outdated, it's irrelevant. And for a while that caused Billy Graham to have doubts in his mind about how he viewed God's word. But then one night sitting in his cabin all alone, he, he examined the scriptures and what the prophets and the apostles said about God's word. And then after a while, he took a walk in the forest, and he knelt down in the forest, and he prayed. And this was his prayer. He said, O oh Lord, there are many things in this book that I don't understand, but by faith, I'm going to accept it as thy word. And from this moment on, I'm going to trust the Bible as the word of God. Wow. Somehow I, I feel a little justified because I have felt this way for several decades that the Bible is God's word. Everything in it is completely true from beginning to end, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and everything in between. It's God's word, God inspired, God breathed. 
We have to reconcile ourselves to the Word of God. We have to search it, examine it, look at the evidence, look at what the Bible says, get on your knees before the Lord. Maybe that's your prayer. Lord, I don't understand everything about the Bible, but by faith, I accept Scripture as your Word. You know, if you haven't done that, maybe it's a good time to do so. In Romans 8, Romans 8, starting in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. The Holy Spirit's a helper, a comforter, a guide. Part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He's one with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. Just like God the Father and God the Son. The Spirit dwelling within us knows exactly what God's will for our life is. You know, since even the most righteous, even the most godly, even the most intelligent people operate within a very limited knowledge. I think it's very wise of us to depend on the Holy Spirit for his guidance, for his leading, for his wisdom. Well, we don't know the future, right? And because of that, our desires might not fit into God's plan. Or it might never occur to us to come to God in prayer asking something that God knows we're going to need eventually, there are believers who give up on prayer because our human limitations, I think, prevent fully understanding how prayer works. Some people are like, it's not very logical to pray to a God you can't see, one who doesn't answer back. But God always answers. It's just sometimes the answer is no or not right now. But those who stop coming to the Lord in prayer miss out on the awesome work of the Holy Spirit within them. You know, he... He directs our prayers. He leads us. He guides us. He impresses upon our heart the truth about what we've asked. And he ultimately opens up our mind to God's will. In our humanness, our natural spirit, uh, a lot of times we ask for something that will only satisfy the flesh. Lord, give me a beautiful mate. God, please give me some money. God, I need a big house. I need a new car. God, let me win the lottery. Anybody? But the Holy Spirit won't present a request that goes against God's will. Instead, he, he intercedes to ask for what is right. At the same time, he leads us and guides us. He he whispers to our heart that what we have requested doesn't line up with God's will. You know, if God's will is what we're truly seeking, if that's our, our goal, our desire, then we're going to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's guidance. Hmm. There's only one way to God the Father. And that's through Jesus Christ, the Son. It seems there's so many who think, oh, well, you know, all roads lead to God. Oh, every, every religion it, it prays to God. They may call him by a different name, but it's all basically the same stuff. Jesus is the only one who lived a life without sin, who died on a cross and took my sins upon himself that I may be saved. There's no one else like that in any other cult or religion, anywhere. No perfect, sinless son of God laid down their life.
Muhammad wasn't perfect. He was a bloodthirsty terrorist pedophile killer, an ignorant fool who denied God. He listened to the devil who disguised himself as the angel Gabriel, and he's leading billions of people to hell with him. Christ is the only way. Jesus paid our debt. In John 12, 31, he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You know, there is a future judgment of the world coming where the wicked are going to be separated from the righteous and cast into the lake of fire. This is biblical. This isn't me speaking my opinion. This is me telling you what God's word says. This verse talks about the sins of the world that were to be placed on Jesus. And he would suffer for our punishment, for our sakes. He paid the price. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Jesus said, I got this. I'll pay the tab. It's on me. Jesus died a horrible death on the cross. He suffered the punishment for our sins. So if you think about it, there's really no reason why we should suffer for our sins also. You see, God took our sins and put them on Christ on the cross, and he in turn took the righteousness of Christ and put it upon those of us who believe that Christ is the only way, that Christ is Lord and Savior. All Jesus asks of us is to make his redemption ours in faith in him as Lord and Savior. Sin has a wage. It must pay, and no one can avoid payday without faith in Christ. Anyone who doesn't accept Jesus and, and become born again is going to be held liable for all the sins they've ever committed as a result of their sinful fallen nature. But those who receive the new birth through faith in Jesus Christ don't have a sin nature, so they won't receive the payment of death, but the one of everlasting life. When given a choice, here's everlasting life or eternal punishment, condemnation. How did Jesus say it in Matthew 25? Let's read the last verse of Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 46. And this is Jesus talking. He said, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Word of Christ. God's word, not mine. The ones he was talking about were the ones that were on God's left hand. The goats. The ones who didn't know God. The ones who denied Jesus Christ. Everlasting punishment. Why would anyone choose that? over everlasting life and fellowship with God the Father. I just don't get it. I don't get it. Physical death, as well as every result of the sinful nature like sickness and fear and anxiety and depression, is only a byproduct of the spiritual death that was already inside of us. You know, God told Adam in the day that he ate the forbidden fruit that he would surely die. Genesis 2, uh, verse 17 or thereabouts. Adam didn't physically die that day, but he did die spiritually that day. I mean, physical death came some 930 years later for Adam. Genesis 5, verse 5. It was a byproduct of his spiritual death. I think there's a reason why God didn't allow anybody to live to be a thousand years old in the Bible. Methuselah was the oldest, 969 years, a full 31 years shy of a thousand years. I think it's because during the millennial reign of Christ, there will be those who see their 1,000th birthday. Think about it. Hmm. Eternal life is a gift from God. Why would you deny this gift? Why would you say, no thanks, Lord. Nah, most of my friends are going to be in hell. I'd rather be there with them. You don't know what you're saying. You don't fully understand where you'll be. 
gift is something that's bestowed voluntarily, without compensation. It's a present. We haven't done anything to earn this gift. All you have to do is receive it by faith in Christ. You know, even if somebody hands you a free gift, there's still something required on your part. You have to reach out and accept it. God gives you the gift of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, his son. All you have to do is accept it. That's it. Believe and receive. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you will believe, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Pretty simple. Why would you not want that? I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Please go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Take somebody with you. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday.